If you have been following the fortunes of the Morgan family in the previous DVDs, you will remember that impressive name, Charles Morgan Robinson Morgan. His father, Sir Charles Morgan, whom we saw presenting his shorthorn bull to William IV in the last DVD, had died in 1846. Here is Charles Morgan Robinson Morgan, pictured with his riding crop. He at last succeeded in being raised to the peerage and later became Baron Tredegar. He was at school at Harrow with Byron and went on to Oxford University. He became a contributor to the Literary Gazette, a scholarly magazine. In 1827, he had been married to Rosamond Mundy, the granddaughter of the famous Admiral Lord Rodney. In 1846, he inherited the joint Tredegar and Rupera estates and moved to Tredegar House. Until then, Rupera Castle had been the main residence in South Wales of Sir Charles and his family. Most of their five sons and six daughters were born and brought up at Rupera. As MP for Breconshire, he was anti-slave trade, but he avoided involvement in electoral reform. At home, he helped to promote Welsh culture through Lady Llanover's Eisteddfodau and donated the Rupera Harp as a prize in 1853. He had a lifelong and passionate devotion to hunting on his vast South Wales estate. Until well into his 80s, he led his famous pack of harrier hounds. These are dogs bred to run and work all day long, hunting otters, foxes and hares with equal skill. Until ill health brought him home, he had spent a lot of time at court, where he was well liked by Queen Victoria. His eldest son and heir, Charles Rodney Morgan was elected MP for Brecon in 1852 at the age of 22. Benjamin Disraeli, in a letter to his wife, said, The news today is pretty good. Young Charles Morgan has won Brecon. Charles Rodney, however, died unmarried at Marseille two years later. His body was brought home and buried in Baysleg churchyard. And so it was, through the death of his elder brother, that the famous and well-loved Godfrey, Lord Tredegar, came to inherit the title and lands of his father, Charles Robinson. But in 1854, Godfrey and his brother Frederick were away fighting in the Crimean War. There was a real prospect of Sir Charles and Lady Morgan losing three sons all in the same year. Godfrey captained a squadron of the 17th Lancers in the charge of the Light Brigade at Balaclava in 1854. He rode his famous horse, Sir Briggs, and was one of only three officers unhurt. And so, at 23 years of age, he found himself a senior officer. The destruction of the Crimean countryside and the slaughter had a great effect on him. In a speech in Newport in 1855, he said, before going out to the Crimea, I was accustomed to see farmers looking happy and contented. But since the war commenced, I've seen the other side of the picture. I've seen an army march into a hostile country, and there, in a few hours, all was desolation. One stone not being left on another, and the people made slaves to the invaders. How thankful we ought to be that we are not suffering at the hands of an invading army. Godfrey succeeded his father, Charles Morgan Robinson Morgan, as Lord Tredegar in 1875. And he too made Tredegar House his residence in South Wales. 
He would become the first Viscount Tredegar in 1905. Here is a statue of Godfrey, Lord Tredegar, on his horse, Sir Briggs. We could tell you much more at this point about Godfrey's generosity towards Newport. He was known as Godfrey the Good and firmly believed that with great wealth and power came great responsibilities. Due to the diligence and of the previous Morgans, the 50,000 acre estate was at the peak of its wealth and influence. His income was said to be 1,000 pounds a day. It is interesting to know that he supported women's suffrage. A tenant was heard to remark, if I could worship anyone but God, it would be Lord Tredegar. Godfrey's younger brother, Frederick, was affectionately known as Colonel Freddy. He made the 3,000 acre estate of Rupera the family home in South Wales for himself and his wife, Charlotte Ann Williamson, and their two sons and two daughters. Rupera Castle can just be seen in the background of this fine oil painting of Colonel Freddy. He too had taken part in and survived the charge of the Light Brigade in 1854. After the war, he had a lengthy career as Colonel of a battalion of the South Wales Borderers. He represented Monmouthshire at Westminster from 1874 to 1900. For the next 50 years, Rupera was a typical aristocratic family-run estate. It supplied plenty of sport for the Morgans and their friends, along with employment for skilled hand-picked locals and outsiders. It seems to have been a happy place to work as long as you knew your place. Here, estate workers are posing before a new summer house in the grounds of the castle. Local people enjoyed the proximity of their own aristocratic family, as indeed do local people today. In 1883, when Colonel Freddy's daughter, Blanche, married Mr. C.T. Hall of the well-known banking family, hundreds of people lined the streets to watch the happy couple proceed from Rupera Castle to Lower Machen Church. The cannon volleys at Rupera echoed as far as Guerna Klepa in Newport. Up and down the Tredegar estate, cottage doors were decorated, and back at Rupera Castle, about 80 ladies and gentlemen, including Lord Tredegar himself, sat down to the wedding breakfast in marquees erected on the lawn. Behind the scenes, and during Colonel Freddy's frequent absences, the management of the Rupera estate ran smoothly. Farm bailiffs and the more important staff, such as head gardener, gamekeepers and lodge keepers, lived with their families in estate houses, while the housekeeper and butler and some servants lived in the castle. The 1901 census recorded that in the castle, apart from Colonel Freddy and his family, there were a butler, a waiter, a footman, a groom, a cook, Two ladies' maids, two laundry maids, a dairy maid, three housemaids, a kitchen maid, a scullery maid, and three stud grooms. Other employees walked from their homes to the castle on the footpaths and climbed over the substantial stiles. These were placed next to the big black gates in the walls, which were opened only on hunting days. Here are the steps of one style at the gate by the end of the paddock of West Lodge. The servant's entrance to the castle itself was through the main gate on the drive and then in through the servant's door on the west side of the castle. Farmer William Beachy lived with his family on the east side of the Rupera estate at Rupera Home Farm a place as old as any of the lands around. His important role was providing the supply of food, particularly meat, poultry and eggs for the castle. Luckily for us, William Beachy sat down to write his diary every evening from 1899 to 1920. After a hard day's work, he made brief notes about the main events of the day as he saw them. Here are some glimpses of Mr. Beachy's daily life at the beginning of 1899. 13th March. 
put six hens to sit in box. Rosa got shingles, Doctor been to see mother, Ivor bad in bed, finished digging the garden, Mr and Mrs F Morgan came to the castle, Colonel Freddy's son and his wife. March 14th, shoot in the deer park, Mr Reeves here today and preaching at the Draythen tonight. Cleaned out the bin house, the rats are there bad. April 3rd, Cardiff races, Colonel Morgan's horse won, torpedo. Turned out a fine day for Easter Monday. April 4th, Mrs Morgan, Colonel Freddy's wife, been dead eight years. Died 1891 at Rupera Castle, 53 years of age. Killed the last pig, sold seven black sheep. April 6th, the new keeper came today. His goods came all the way from Stroud in a one-horse van. The horse brought it all the way its own self. Heard the cuckoo today. June 13th. Finished shearing 224. Little Roland sheared a little on two of them, tied them, pitched them and packed up the wool. July the 31st, mother gone to Rudry Mill to order meal and pay for the last. A very hot day, 72 degrees in the shade, hauling water from the pond to Rupera Garden. The Colonel been two days down to Tredriga cricket match. August 7th, took a sheep up to the castle, 58 pounds, and 36 eggs, also bacon, 52 pounds, and a ham and two fowls. The Colonel came back from Brecon, up there four days after grouse. October 16th, the war with the Transvaal is begun. Lord Tredegar sent 16 horses. Baysleg ploughing match held at Guernation Farm. The Colonel could not stop for the dinner, had to go to London for the opening of Parliament about the Transvaal War. October 2nd, Colonel returned to Parliament unopposed. Went up to the castle to hear him speak. A lot of people up there singing and dancing. Been in Parliament about 26 years. This is Mr. Beach's succinct entry for January the 22nd, 1901. Queen Victoria died. Moved the foot rot tub out of the yard into the hay shed. The Morgans spared no expense or effort to entertain their guests on the Rupera estate. Colonel Lindsay of Astradvaur, married to Colonel Freddy's sister, was chief constable of Glamorgan and master of the Glamorgan hounds. He and his friends regularly galloped down to Rupera and over the mountain to Bedwas. Colonel Freddy and his daughter, Violet Mundy, were renowned for their prowess and passion for hunting and were always out in front of all the others. Colonel Freddy staying in the saddle all day long, getting soaking wet. A letter from Colonel Freddy to a Miss Woodruff, a member of a Monmouthshire family, shows the social importance of the hunting events. April the 18th, 1889, Rupera Castle, Newport, Morn. Dear Miss Woodruff, your little brother left us just too soon on Monday, as five minutes after he had gone, we killed a fox. Lord Tredega asked where he was, and on hearing he had left, asked me to send him the brush. So I got Charles Barrett to cure it. It's the one without the white end to it. The one with the white end is one we killed not long since, and which I beg your acceptance of, as you certainly deserved one on Monday, as much if not more so than anyone else. Yours very truly, Frederick Morgan. Kath Ayres, who lived in the Draythen, near the Hollybush Inn, had this to say about the fox hunting. Her grandparents, but not her parents, were very interested in hunting. 
Now, my whole family, my mother's family and father's family, except my father and mother, would have, were all interested in hunting. They would leave work, you know, they would, if my, if my aunts and all were washing, they'd leave washing to go for half hours hunting. So I remember my grandmother taking me hunting one day. I was about eight. And they killed in front of the castle, in the front now, in that field. And she said, she was disgusted at me. I turned green and I was sick in front of everybody. Yeah. I said, and I've never been interested. No. That was the first time you've seen That's the first time I've seen that. that. Mm. Yeah. I mean, today I think they got the human killer with them, haven't they? But that was just tearing it limb from limb. She said, you went the colour of the grass, she said. Yeah. And then you were sick in front of everybody. Disgusting, she said. My mother said, well, not a bit of one. You ought to have more sense. She said, there's a letter to see a kill. <coughs> I know I've always been a, I was a tough kid, you know. Yeah. I thought it was anyway. But that I couldn't stand, I couldn't stand. Bert Stradling, who lived at Fald Gerrig near the crossroads by Rupera Park Lodge and about half a mile from the castle, walked to his work as a post delivery boy at the castle in 1906, aged 14. Well, I had a brother working at the, at, the, at the farm, see? And then I saw the bailiff, and then I got took on. Um, the bulk of the post, which was brought up from Newport, was Colonel Freddy's parliamentary correspondence. Bert also found a few odd jobs where needed. He earned five shillings a week, paid at the end of the month, about three pound a week today. But the estate later paid for his apprenticeship to a building firm. But then uh, you should get a little bit sometimes when he shoots on, you know. Mm. You would have a day shooting, you know, beating, see. Mm. You get extra for that. Mm. And a feed. Mm. How much would you be paid for a day's beating? Well, they give you five bob. Mm. And if you could, with one of the tops that are shooting, you know, if you could get carry his cartridge bag, look, he'd give you a tip. Mm. I always used to look out for one, you know, Brains Brewery. There was one there, J.H.T. Brain. He used to come to these big shoots because, see, they used to, they used to rare about 4,000 birds a year mm. up there, you know. Mm. I used to look out for him. I was a pound tip. Mm. Oh, God. Mm. J.H.T. Brain. Pheasant shooting was a very important sporting event on the estate. Raising the pheasants was entrusted to first-class gamekeepers. The head keeper would live with his family in the preserve as seen in this picture. There was a yard where the birds were raised and where two or three retrievers were kept as sentries in a dog house. Every day the dogs were put on top of a table with straw under them while their house was scrubbed out. At the start of the breeding season, broody hens were bought from local people and then given back later. Each hen sat on about 14 to 15 pheasant eggs in nest boxes along the inside of the yard wall. They would hatch out three batches of eggs. They were taken off the nest for a while every morning. A slip knot of string was put on the leg and fastened to a stake in the ground, giving them enough freedom to walk about and find their food. When the chicks were old enough, they were moved into hen coops with little runs in the big field in front of the castle. An underkeeper stayed in the field all day, feeding them with hard boiled eggs chopped up and boiled minced rabbits. They graduated to little feeding platforms out in the field where they were free to run about. Sometimes on a nice June summer evening, it would be midnight before the underkeeper could get them in off the field and there was no overtime in those days. Shooting days provided work for others, when as many as 30 pheasants would be hung up in the kitchen and left until they stank and were moving with maggots. Then the kitchen staff would take over. Mrs Penhallerick was a cook at the castle in the 1920s. She had lost her husband through a coal mining accident and went home to Bedwas to her children every night. 
Jenny Priest worked as a maid in the castle. They both remembered feathering the pheasants. Mrs. P said, you just had to get used to it. But 16-year-old Jenny would cry because the maggots would be climbing up over her hands. Jenny had been a rather stroppy teenager, but she came to realize how lucky she was to be employed on the estate, even though her parents had to buy her uniform. She shared a lovely attic bedroom with other maids, was well fed and better off than if she had stayed at home. Poaching on the Rupera estate was always a problem. Five or six gamekeepers were employed and at one time four policemen, just for Rupera. Bert remembered gamekeeper Alf Deacon. All the other keepers go, they used to tell a lot of lies, see? But all Alf would say exactly what was on and what was done. And he always did, they treat him, give him drink and all. He could go anywhere in risk with, with, with the summons. He had a nasty boat, a bump up on the top there, look. Mm. And Bob Bob from Kelly on the grey, grey there, see? But there were two or three of them, they, they knew there was a bloke in there. That bloke is alive now, isn't he? Oh, I know he's dead now. <laughs> a bloke named him a carpenter. Well, the keepers and the police were around there, see? In different ways, but all that, I have dropped across him. In the wood there. Mm. And the, the gun jammed, or else Alf would have been a dead one. Mm. Ah, the, the trigger jammed, see? The gun didn't go off. But he hit Alf with the butt of the gun here. And after that was not a bit of good. But he stuck to him. He stuck to him and they rolled from the top there down. On that bank. And all Alf stuck to him. There was other keepers down the bottom, see? Ah, carpenter his name was. He was from over here somewhere. He was a good old keeper. Alf, he used to live in the dry and the last going off. Where he was born. And living with his fair parents in Kungla, um, St. Kellyan. In the old cottage, yes. Oh, I yes. Young Doris Oram lived at Triskithan in the Draythan. Here she is with her friend, Marion Beeston, in later life. Because these woods just kept beautiful when I was a child. Okay. Like lovely rides, you know. Yeah. You could walk like the lawns, you know. Yeah. You, did you used to go over there when you were a child? No, to go up the castle. I used to go and sit, well, Mrs. Blackburn, um, they used to go and watch him for poachers in those days. Yeah. And I used to go and sit with her. And Mr. Blackburn had been as far as the castle. At 12 o'clock, it's a chime 12. And then, because I had my brother's dog, you know, two lovely Labradors, and I wasn't a bit afraid. Yeah. And I used to come in that ride. And then my mother used to come up by the door in those days now and again with a lamp because we didn't have no electric. No. Yeah. And I knew she knew, I knew she was there, you know. I used to go up there very often because Mr. Blackburn used to go out, they used to go out in the night watching the poachers. Mm. And I know when I used to come down the wood, I'd see a cigarette here and there because the poachers must be been hiding. I, I wasn't afraid. Colonel Freddy's son, Courtney, the new Lord Tredegar, tried to control the poaching in 1918 by closing down the Hollybush Inn in the Draythen where the poachers used to meet. It didn't open again until after the Second World War. Courtney was born at Rupera Castle in 1867. From 1884 until his death, he was attached to the Royal Monmouthshire Engineers. He served in the Boer War under General French during the liberation of Kimberley. He was married in 1890 to Catherine Kanegi, daughter of the 9th Earl of Southesk, and they had two children. Evan and Gwyneth. Theirs was not a happy family. Courtney combined extravagant benevolence with a good life for himself, hunting and shooting and sailing his yachts. He appears to have been unaware of the disasters in store for great estates. He simply spent the capital of the estate without improving his income. The large horsepower engines on his luxurious 92-foot motor yacht Silvana, specially built by Camper Nicholson, attracted great publicity. Eventually, he donated it to the Royal Yacht Squadron, where he was a lifelong member. At the beginning of the Great War, he donated the friars in Newport to the Royal Gwent Hospital as a convalescent home. 
He bought Pulitzer's $1.5 million yacht, Liberty, in 1914, and then donated it to the Royal Navy. He commanded it himself for a while, and then fitted it out as a hospital ship. At the end of the war, he refitted it and sailed it twice around the world. He managed to visit every British colony. Courtney was the first president of the newly formed Forestry Commission in 1921. Fast-growing conifers had to be planted after the loss of wood in the Great War. Unfortunately, to make room for them, much of Coid Crygrupera's ancient native woodland was cut down. This picture shows Coid Rupera clear felled to the north of the Hollybush. Courtney loved Rupera, his childhood home. He wanted to make up for his frugal father's neglect of the buildings at Rupera. No expense was spared to create a luxurious and modern home for his son Evan to live in after his marriage. In the deer park, a new reservoir and pump house were built. The Kew Garden designers, Mackenzie and Montcur, were commissioned to build a beautiful glass house. A new powerhouse was fitted with steam generators, dynamos and boilers. The large stable block was restored after a fire, in the style of its original appearance in 1790. A new east entrance porch was added to the castle. The brew house, laundry and dairy range known as the Bothy were now converted to quarters for chauffeurs and garden staff. Another summer house was built in the grounds of the castle. But Evan had other ideas. Life in London and Paris with friends like H.G. Wells, the Duke of Windsor and Alistair Crowley attracted him more. He preferred entertaining a Tredegar house to the country pursuits of Rupera. If Evan was unimpressed by the innovations at Rupera, the new glass house built in 1913 must have delighted Angus MacKinnon, head gardener since 1894. He and Agnes and their family lived in the right-hand house in the Bothy, with the gardener boys as weekly boarders in the left. The well-loved Angus MacKinnon was devoted to his beautiful gardens. Many people remembered being told that they could duck under the nets to pick and eat the strawberries and raspberries. He was helped by a large gardening staff. Let Mary Thomas, who cooked and cleaned for the MacKinnons, tell you about them. Mary's family lived along the Rupera Drive, and kindly Angus MacKinnon used to bring morning sticks and vegetables for them. She was 20 years old when she went to work for the MacKinnons at the Bothy. I'd scrub this big room out, you know, there's a big long table there, scrubbed, and uh, cook for them, and they'd come in and a gramophone. No, as a wireless, was it not a gramophone? It was a big thing them days to get that. Mm. And one was a beautiful dancer. But of course, they'd been in the garden, you can imagine, can you? Mm. There they were dancing, they were this. It was a gramophone, I think. Mm. And um, I'd have to scrub the kitchen again after dinner, because the boss, Mrs. McKinnon, yeah. oh, I thought if cleaners was about the day, they only last two minutes. Because mm. you want to do it right, you know. Yeah. I should have played it for that for you to be idle a minute. And the food is unbelievable. It doesn't have you know, uh, preserving sugar. Nothing. It's half a crown, it doesn't have. Do you know I made a hundred pound on jam? Yes, nearly made one. But jam is in the bottle. Mm -hmm. For the boys, yeah. for they'd all of it, fruit of the garden, see? Mm -hmm. And uh, I wasn't in a preserving pan or a stove. It was over this range. And gosh, if it boiled up, it was a huge suspect, you know, to pick up like yeah. It's a <laughs> frightening yeah. tale, yeah. you know. Yeah. She used to, I'll tell you what she used to make, you know, she was Scotch lady. It was, um, what do you call it now? Soup, I'm very sweet. Imagine every veg in it, 
all, you know, the curly greens just cut up, you know, like parsley. And not a veg out of it. I mean, no, I don't eat it. Shred it. Oh, I never tasted anything like it. It's just mm. all. She'd bring a big basin of that over of us. Mm. And be on a Tuesday. And she'd make beautiful tea. Bar East Loaf. She couldn't make it. on East Loaf, but she would go home. Mm. Mm. But she'd make us some tanner loaf with butter or mm. butter. Oh, it's just beautiful. Mm. Yeah. And I tell you what I used to like, they used to keep bees and you know the comb, mm. that was for tea milk, a square of that black. Like. Mm. And they give you that then? Yes. Yeah, well, yeah. perhaps they'd ask me to stop the tea or something. Yeah, I'm saying something down the road. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. And chickens, yeah. No, he lived, yeah. To see the castle, huh? the seal of the castle, didn't he? Yes, I think so, did he? Yes, he did. Because Jan Long buried Mrs. McKinnon. Mm. And Evan Morgan never said he was sorry or anything. He was awful upset about that. Because mm. if it was just Evan Morgan's father, yeah, he'd, yeah. he'd go yeah. in and have a cup of tea with him and have the body. Yeah. Oh, not a tea yeah. event. Yeah. 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 He'd walk around the gardens, Mrs. McKinnon said, and do a little he was uh, not in the castle. We them to sit on the front steps to talk and both of them sit on those steps to talk, you know. Mary Thomas can be seen sitting on those very steps in this picture. In 1920, Courtney, now Viscount Tredegar, lent Rupera Castle for the wedding reception of Mr Rodney Forrester Walker and Miss Molly Vincent Clifford Wing. Masses of lilies, azaleas and hydrangeas lined the silver-grey staircase of Rupera Castle. The oak-panelled banqueting hall was laid out as a buffet and decorated with pink and red carnations, no doubt supplied from the carnation houses on either side of the new glass house. But by the 1920s, there was just a skeleton staff left at Rupera, with the surplus of food supplied by William Beachy sent on to Tredegar House. The Morgans visited only for hunting and shooting parties. The housemaid, Jenny Priest, said, there wasn't a terrible lot of work had to keep the place because it was a tremendous place and it was beautiful. It really was a beautiful. The furnishing and that was, well, it was immaculate, you know. And of course, it would be a rush now. His lordship is coming tomorrow or the next day or whenever it was with the little crowd. <gasps> Take all the dust sheets off right through the place and all. And the grates, they were enormous. They were enormous and great big stands inside and they all had to be done with emery paper and oh, it was the most horrible job ever. On the landings, each little landing they had the uh, armour, that's right. Oh yes, terrific. Oh terrific it was. And there was those landings from here and they had to be kept, believe you me. And Mrs Watts watched that they were kept. You wouldn't have a speck like that of dust all in the cracks and cracks, you know. A staff dining room. Yeah. And that was, oh, from here right down to the house down there. Mm. Tremendous with the table down through the centre. Well, of course, the Rupera staff, when they had the staff, the staff came from Tredegar Park yeah. when there was any big do. Yeah. And uh, you sat in order of merit. Yeah. Well, me being, I was down the bottom end of the table, wasn't it? But when he wasn't in residence, mm. we didn't we didn't use the servants' hall no. for uh, our meals because there was only four. Miss Watts used to have her own room. Yeah. She was wait, waited on in that room. And we had a small room, well, what they called the butler's kitchen, I think yeah. it was. Of course, we had to clear out of there when he came yeah. into residence because the butler took over there in the footman. In the 1930s, the rooms of the castle impressed the new little housemaid Gladys Vaughan. From the elegance of the gold and red furniture and the balcony over the dining room, down to the massive basement kitchen with its huge range. 
Well, when I went to repair it, it was a housekeeper and a housemaid and myself and Queenie. I think she did the cooking. And we lived up in the butler's pantry and we mostly lived on boiled beef and carrots. And we used to start work. I used to have to look after the housekeepers if she was a lady, which I resented because I thought I was going to work for Lord Tredegar. So after breakfast, we used to start our work. And it was polish, polish, polish. I used to have to be down on my knees and rub the polish in till you couldn't see it. And the housemaid used to go over it with a polisher. And we'd do that till four o'clock in the afternoon. They had a beautiful stone staircase with a grey carpet as well and there were all the pictures of the family on the wall. But the whole time she was there, Lord Tredegar visited only once bringing his staff from Tredegar House and she never saw him. The only sign of his presence was the cigar butt left in the study. Gladys would have liked it if there had been parties, but there was nothing at all. The castle was being kept in perfect condition ready for the sale. The creation of Godfrey as the first Viscount in 1905 had confirmed the Morgan position as part of the English aristocracy. At Courtney's death in 1934, the Tredegar estate had grown to 53,000 acres. However, poor financial management, combined with the new Death Duties Act of 1894, brought about the ruin of the Morgan family fortunes. Colonel Freddie had died in 1909, Godfrey Lord Tredegar in 1913, and Courtney in 1934. Work began to draw up records of deeds, rents and possessions. It then became apparent that some properties of the estate would have to be sold. Rupera was the first choice. There was a fair amount of interest in the sale, but the attractions of a hunting and shooting estate were waning. In the end, no buyer came forward. A sale of the contents of the castle in 1935 lasted over a week. People were eager to buy, but saddened to see the end of Rupera. The unsold items were removed to Tredegar House. A caretaker staff was left. The castle and grounds, once loved and beautifully maintained, were abandoned by the family and no Morgans ever lived at Rupera again. When it was known that the British Army was going to requisition Rupera in 1939, a list of all the furniture and fittings of the castle was drawn up by one of the estate officers, Mr Trevor Jenkins. He then went away to the war, and the list was presumed lost. But when Mr Jenkins returned, he remembered exactly in which cupboard in the Tredegar estate office it lay. In this way, Evan, Lord Tredegar, was able to claim insurance when the castle was burnt out in 1941. Evan died in 1948. A year later, his nephew, John, the last Baron Tredegar, took James Lees Milne, the first president of the newly formed National Land Trust, to visit Rupera. In his book, Midway on the Waves, James Lees Milne commented, this fine morning we motored to repair a castle, which the Welsh want to buy from John as a memorial to Welshmen killed in the war and vest in the National Trust. I could not see any point in it at all. His comments sealed the castle's fate. <laughs>